She's remembered for her intense, in-your-face characters who seemed liberated years before that term was used to describe women. She first made her mark in theater and eventually found success in both film and television. She thrived on the popular TV series Evening Shade, and during her career, she crossed paths with such stars as Vivian Lee, Michael Douglas, Nicolas Cage, and Robert Redford. Coming up in our interview, she speaks publicly for the first time about her 1977 rape and beating and discusses what it took to survive that difficult ordeal. Hello, I'm Ernie Manoose. On this episode of Interviews, join us for our conversation with Tony Award-winning actress Elizabeth Ashley. career, how have you seen theater change? Drastically. <laughs> really? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm very lucky because I came in sort of at the end culmination, whatever, of what was the most fertile time right. in the American theater. Uh, I mean, because it was really kind of from the 30s 40s, you know, 50s and, and into the 60s, where the theater uh, had this voice where it actually, it, it still was what the theater's only task in life is because it should be the last bottom line in the sand forum for the dangerous ideas. It is home to the to heretics and outlaws because which are so necessary to a culture because without the heretics, the questioners, the outlaws, the naysayers, you only have the status quo. And if all you have is the status quo, that goes back to that deal in a vacuum. It won't, can't survive. And so it will implode. And that's what keeps a culture alive, right? And the theater... The theater was sort of sacred ground because that was where you could go, and that which that which could not be said, thought, spoken, dreamed of, evidenced in any way. That's where the that was the theater's job, and there was still a bunch of that round, yeah. and um, it, it was a time when new play. I mean, new plays were done, new plays, many, many, many of them in a season. And, of course, I mean, due to progress, of which I'm not a great fan, civilization, which I have severe doubts about, and economics, which I accept as a given, the theater, uh, the Broadway theater, I think that's what, we, that's what I was referencing, the Broadway theater, or the bigs, as some people like to think of it, <laughs> has kind of, it's in danger of falling into the theme park pit. Mm -hmm. I mean, now, there will always be exceptions to that. I mean, there's a play like Doubt, which is as brilliant to play and challenges everything. And, I mean, it's just delicious and wonderful and all that. But, when, I mean, there was always a place for whatever the equivalent of a Mamma Mia was. But the theater has not been around for over a thousand years in some form or another to be the home to disco, mm -hmm. particularly retread disco. And I think, uh, I think that everybody, since I've been in it, which is, I am ancient, so I've been there a long time. I made my Broadway debut in 1959. Yeah. So I think, oh, I don't know. I, mean, I, I think that there's a whole sort of cycle that I'll bet you that back there with Aristophanes and those guys and the Greeks, they were saying, oh, man, I mean, it's over. It's, it's, it's dead. dead. I mean, nothing's <laughs> happening. I mean, yeah, there were those frogs, but, you know, come on. And, I mean, I'm not sure this is the place for frogs. So I think that it's, it's going through uh, a kind of dry cycle, but 
I think it always writes itself, and there is it always keeps going. And I believe I think that's because it's alive. Yeah, the and passion you feel for theater, though, have you always felt that? Has that always been part of you? When you say the passion that I, mean, I feel for, what do you mean? Well, when I see you talk about it and how into the theater you are, and how oh, much sugar, you I'm one of those people. Of I'll it. give you the weather report like it comes from the voice <laughs> of God. It's just a really unfortunate mannerism I have. I mean, I okay. There is, there, there is passion there because it's my racket. I mean, it's what I know. It's what I do. It's the only thing I've ever been able to do upon occasion well. And it's the only place I've ever kind of felt. I was at home, you know, where you feel, I know how to, I know how to do this. With the exceptions, of course, when you start rehearsal. I've never started rehearsal in my life. Rehearsal is, 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 is sort of like, for a woman getting your period in childbirth, you forget that you've done it many times before. It's something, it's not a matter, you get lobotomized. So in rehearsal is like that. Because always the first couple of days of rehearsal, I think, I've been doing this for 50 years. I must know how to do it, but I don't remember. I don't know what to do. And it happened, it's one of those things that actors like to think is their deep, dark secret, yeah. but it happens to everybody. So there's that. But it, overall, it's the only place I've ever felt like I kind of knew what I was doing, really. Well, when you talk about not knowing and that, that moment in rehearsal, but you're out and you talk to students and you're educating a whole new generation of actors, what are you teaching them then? Is it something that's just innate or God is there a only skill? God knows. You don't have a clue. I'm corrupting the <laughs> minds, hearts, and souls of the young with any luck. I'm turning them into heretics. I'm getting them to question absolutely every assumption in life. No, I mean, I'm... I, well, yes, I probably am. So what am I teaching them? Right. I think you'd probably have to ask them. What do you go in, though? What's your goal? What are you trying to impart on them? To be dangerous, to take risks, to question that the theater is the forum of dangerous ideas, and its task is to illuminate the human condition for better and worse, because one does not exist without the other. And it is... To, in other words, to make them understand that, yes, everybody grows up, you know, wanting to be the Super Bowl quarterback and a movie star, right? Because right. those are <laughs> they, those are iconic images in our culture. But, and and unfortunately, many, many people think the only reason in your the, your, that anybody acts in the theater is because they can't get a job in movies or TV, which unfortunately is much of the time true. However... Not always. And I sort of think of myself as a specialist. God knows, I mean, I, I did a lot of film. I was never a very good film actress. I mean, I, I, I was never as comfortable or creative in it. And I'm not sure that it is as creative a medium for the actor. But you chose not to take, was it Barefoot in the Park, to the screen? Yeah, but I mean, I was really young then. That was yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's not like they were knocking down my door. There was one faction of the studio that really, really wanted me. But Hal Wallace, who is like the big, big, huge producer at Paramount, really, really wanted Jane Fonda. Was a much hotter sort of actress than I was, and it got it got into where all these sort of political. Games. It was one of the first times I was ever exposed to that, you know, where, oh, well, we want you to show up this restaurant where that guy is because he's one of how I... And I am on occasion at my best pretty good at the job, you know, the tote that barge, lift that bale part. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the, the politics of career or any of that, you are looking at the worst... In the world. I mean, I have, I, I, it's not that I, I was not, when I was young, willing to give it a try. I was just really never any good at that. It, I mean, the, the take meeting talk, do you'll give phone to lunch. The worst. I mean, I, I think my sense of humor is my defense mechanism. And I'll try to act, you know, like a, like a regular actress and, you know, and I'll, I, I'll take a vow that I'll sit there and do that and, so it's always like the emperor's new clothes to yeah. me. I mean, the first thing in any situation in life I see, when everybody sees the emperor in all of his garments, I, I see, as we would say in the South, a naked man. And <laughs> I think that's pretty funny. And I've, I'll try so hard 
to not say it, but I mean, I, I won't be able to stop myself and say, hey, it's a <laughs> And it, that's off-putting. But does people. the work win in the end? Oh, yeah. In the end, being a quality actor, is that going to pay off? Or do you have to play quality the games? Quality actor. Uh, oh, well, yeah, sure. I think, yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's, look, it's, it's luck, it's timing, it's, it's, it's circumstances, situations. It's a throw of the dice, you know? But none of that is really in your control. All you can do is the work. And that's the part I like. I'm kind of thinking of myself as a mechanic. I mean, the part, the part about acting that I really like is like getting under the hood of the car. It's like, it's like being a private eye. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a part of everybody that wants to grow up to be. Nancy Drew, you know, but I, I love the detective work. I love the research. I love the figuring it out. I like the, I like being the emotional, spiritual, psychological detective. I like going through the script and parsing it. I love the discovery. You know how all those lawyer shows on TV, you know, and so we, and court TV and everything, we've learned about discovery, right? right? Well, discovery is my specialty. You know, I mean, there's, with with great plays particularly, and great writers, there's always something to be discovered because the writer has written it down consciously, right? But it's all, everything's being fed by our subliminal subconscious life. I mean, consciousness is only the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Let me and find something A lot of it's that. under there. There's talk of, and when I read about you, there's this period of time where you stepped out of show business, in yeah. a sense, from 65 to 70. And but I've I retired seen, twice. <laughs> okay, I see a bunch of excuses or reasons or explanations as to why. Excuses? What was Ex- it? Why? <laughs> I knew when I said that word you were going to jump oh, on Oh, you're going to get a taste of my backhand. It's not a very good show. <laughs> why did why you Why would I away? need an excuse? See, the, 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 let me tell you the deal I don't get. Okay. Is, okay, I know that it is a very popular cultural habit to think of Anyone that becomes even a moderately famous actor or actorette at any time. And I'm not, I'm not accusing you of this, but, but the, you, we all know that in commercial television and all of the sort of commercialized backstage show rackets stuff, there's this, there's this, this thing of, well... I mean, you, you're, you're like somebody that was standing in the deli and bought the lottery ticket, and you won. It could have been anybody else, but you were just lucky. Right. Let me tell you something. To be an actress is to work like a dog, sweat like a horse, and on occasion crawl like a snake. It is not easy. It is The labor of it is very, very hard work. I mean, it's not limo, learjet, caviar, and cocaine. It is, I mean, I know that it's more fun for the media, whoever they may be, to think of it that way. But it really isn't. You, I mean, the, there's a lot of labor. I'm not saying the rest doesn't go on. Mm-hmm. But there's labor. There's a lot of hard labor. And who says, where is it written, that because you do something, right? I mean, I've I've never been late for work. I've never slacked on the job. I've always given 800%, you know, and all I've ever asked of anyone is that they work maybe a third as hard as I do, said she with great humility. (laughs) But that's when I'm on the job because I'm a work ethic kind of person. But that means that there's an awful lot of life you don't do. Because being an artist, it's a conscious decision to leave the regular world. It's not a nine-to-five job. There is no democracy in art, nor should there be. Uh, You have no entitlements. You have very few rights. You know, you have chosen to live outside the line. Okay? So it, 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 it consumes you. I mean, you have, don't have a lot of downtime because you can't turn off your mind, your heart, your imagination, any of that. So where is it written that you don't get to just leave? Just leave and go. I always wanted to be an adventuress. Mm-hmm. So I went adventuring. Well, the first time, I'd never really had a father. And uh, 
I met this movie star who was, the, who was 14 years older than me. He was the oldest, whitest guy I'd ever met. He was really an authoritarian figure who, and wasn't like anybody I'd ever known. And, and he, he went right, he jumped right into that daddy box. And I mean, I mean, big mistake, maybe. But on the other hand, I got my glorious son. And I did manage to learn, I mean, because, I mean, it's interesting to be a movie star's wife held hostage in Beverly Hills. I mean, it's like, it's like being the furniture, you know. I mean, it's a, a kind of interesting thing, and it's an interesting perspective. You learn a lot of things that actors probably shouldn't know when you see it that much from the inside out. But walking away, were you ever scared that you wouldn't be able to come back? That your time would have then passed? Or don't you think in Well, my terms? time sort of was passed. But you came back. You, well, I came back because I was a... a I mean, cause, well, because I got divorced and wouldn't take alimony and had to go to work, right? <laughs> but I had to sort of start all over. But the... Look... I have been told incessantly and forever, well, not anymore, certainly, but that all all my viable years, you know, in career, you know, that this is no way to run a career. And you know what? They were right. It wasn't. I mean, because to establish... I mean, even if I'd been a good film actress, I mean, I was sort of okay, but I wasn't great. I mean... It was, to, but to establish that kind of career, you only have about a five-year window to establish it, to, you know. And after that, you're so, like, when I was 30 years old and got divorced, right? I was 30. I got divorced, and I went back to my old agent, right, and said, you know, I'm, I'm, I really, I'm going to have to work, a, go to work again, you know. And he said, listen, <laughs> I, this, I, this is verbatim. I said, listen, he said, I couldn't get you a guest shot on Bonanza. He said, you better <laughs> rethink this divorce deal. He, he, he said, you're on the OTB list. And I said, what would that be? Old, tired, broad. I was 30. Ooh, ooh. And now, now that, that, that it was, I mean, centuries ago that I was 30. So when I say that times have changed now, I, well, I would never say that. Times have not changed. But since then, there's been the women's movement. So they know better than to say it that way. Mm-hmm. But, so, I mean, thank God I was a stage actress. And, and, I mean, that was one of the great strokes of luck. Because, I mean, I started out, when I had to go to work again, I mean, I was doing really, kind, I mean, if it were not for Michael Kahn, if it were not for Tuesday Well having turned down the offer to do that great production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof with Tennessee and like that, and Michael Kahn coming to me, I would probably be, with any luck, a second-rate television actress today. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know because I, you do, when you don't do it for a while, when you retire, the thing that you lose is confidence. And all your chops are in your confidence. And so, so you, you tend to regress to a kind of timidity that you have to get through. Right. Have I answered any of your You questions? have, you have. And, and what that leads me to is in the late 70s, you had a very traumatic personal experience. And I'm wondering, how do you build out of that? Which one are you talking about? There was the rape. And how do you get your yes. confidence back after something like that? Oh, confidence. Well, confidence for me was... was uh, I, was gonna, I was going to be glib and say confidence wasn't the problem. I think everything is the problem. But you got to understand, that was very God. That was an experience that nobody's ever had. Okay. What went through my head was, I think the kind of process I have as, as an actress, that sort of moment to moment, breathe your way through it, you know. I knew that the point was to not get killed, okay? Mm -hmm. That's what I knew the point was, because it was, I mean, mine was, it was was strangers, you know, and, and, and like that. But I, 
I never discussed it. The only reason I ever, ever discussed it was many years later, a friend of mine in Nashville was assaulted in her own bed, in her own house. You know, somebody came in. And, uh, and it was his trial. And at that particular time, in that particular place, they weren't taking all of that very seriously. And so uh, uh, Emmy Lou Harris, who is also a friend, and, and, and several other women, and I decided the judge wanted a statement from... And so, so that that's that's the first time that I had ever, ever, right. ever discussed it publicly, because I'm very, very and I tell you, I'm anti-victim. I never want to be a victim. I think it's a terrible trap to see yourself as a victim, and to let things victimize you, because we have this whole institutional apparatus that immediately knows how to deal with victims, and so you get cast in that part in your own mind and right. habits. The first thing that went through my mind after I realized I was alive, because I, mean, I, was, I was driving my car from Los Angeles to San Francisco, and I had been out of the country sailing, I mean, out of civilization, and I didn't know about self-serve gas, and I was, you know, late at night trying to read the thing, which wasn't smart. I mean, mm-hmm. I know better than that. But, so, I mean, it was that. But I, uh, but after I was back in my car, like, you know, I mean, I, I, was, I was beat up, but thank God I was able to, you know, drive. But the, the thing that went through my head, and this is perhaps emblematic of the time, was because women didn't tell. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't, it wasn't, you just didn't say it. You just didn't say it. And this is irrational, perhaps, but the thing that went through my mind was I will get through this, I will get through this by myself, I will not give them this on me now I don't one can theorize much about who that them is, I think perhaps it is the 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 world of a certain kind of male which at that particular time, it would, was not taken seriously. Mm-hmm. And I, being a somewhat lippy, insurgent woman, had um, perhaps insulted certain fra- you know, factions. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, think that, I think that that is perhaps just, it has no meaning other than it's emblematic of the time. How long did it take you, though, to get back to being you? Do you ever recover fully? From really me or to yeah. seem like me? Really you. Because I seemed like me in two days, you know. Yeah. Uh, really me? It changes you forever. It, but I tell you, I had, thank God, again, the skills that I learned as an actress helped me enormously. I don't mean the acting part. I mean the, the scraping the plaque off the way you think and off the way you feel And really examining yourself was to, I'd seen so many women that it had happened to. It's a very common thing, one way or another. And it made them bitter, and it made them afraid, and it it was always an open wound. And I relentlessly examined myself, the... uh, uh, so to to clean myself of that, it was not going, it would stain me, but it would not twist me, okay? Yeah. So in some sense, I became, the main thing it was not going to do is make me afraid because I've only been able to live my life the way I have lived it by being reckless, careless, to, you know, caution to the winds kind of thing. I mean, walking away from a big-time showbiz career twice. <laughs> God, they can't imagine it. <laughs> it's just, if, if I were afraid, I would never have run any risks. And mm-hmm. I think I must have been very, very, very frightened as a very, very young child. And I guess... Um, a, I can, it, it, fear is the worst enemy on earth. And so uh, quite often I did really stupid, reckless, unwise things just because I was afraid of them. Mm-hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And 
Maybe that's not the worst reason to do really stupid, dangerous, reckless stuff. Just simply because you're afraid of it. Something is gained if you learn to not be afraid. I mean, I'm not talking about put your hand in the fire. Right. I don't think. <laughs> okay, people will kill me if I don't ask something about Evening Shade. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> evening Shade was great. Evening, evening Shade was the best damn job. I mean, first of all, I, it's the only television series I ever did. Right. And But, but you got to understand me, not because I wouldn't have, but because it was the only one I was ever really kind of ask to do in a serious way at the right time. But we, we, we go to Big Bert, right? I mean, I've known Bert Reynolds. Reynolds forever. Yes. I mean, and I, when I was about 19, Bert was about 23 or 24 in New York, and he and, and I think Rip Torn and Bruce Dern were sharing an apartment that was the size of these three seats, you know, <laughs> so they had a sleep and shift. And Bert was kind of, he was like a stunt guy. And, all. and so I've known Bert forever. And Bert is one of the best people I've ever known in the show Rackets. Because with Bert, what you see is what you get. There's no breakdown between private reality and public image. And I've often said that Bert's one of those national treasures. He doesn't have fans. He has a constituency, you know. <laughs> and Bert also is, I mean, he's not a creature of the system. He, he is one of those completely self-invented people. And he's such a smart and talented man. And he will do everything to keep you from knowing that, except, his, you know, when he performs, he won't. But Bert handpicked that cast, right? Yeah. And so it was, and everybody I knew that, because we shot that on the lot with Seinfeld and Roseanne and all their shows, and all these people had done a lot of television series, and everybody would come over and visit us. You know, it was great because everybody was sort of on the old MTM lot. People would come visit. And all these people that were, like really went from one series to the next, they would say, my God. You have no, you can't imagine how lucky you are. Because first of all, there were no suits on the set, right? <laughs> and Bert dealt with all the politics. And we had, I mean, it was Ossie Davis and Charlie Durney and Michael Jeter and Bert. And I mean, the, the Hal Holbrook. Yeah. The cast of that was astonishing. And most of us were old stage whores. I mean, we didn't care what color the rug in the dressing room was. <laughs> you know, nobody cared yeah. about that. And there was, I mean, the, so the, we, and it was also a crowd that was not, not your 21-year-old set. So you didn't have a lot of those. In a lot of television series, because of demographics, they have a lot of like really young, really, really cute people. Can't always tell them apart, but they're really cute. <laughs> and a lot of late lip. You know, there's yeah. girls that I've spent years thinking they'd been hit in the mouth, and the <laughs> domestic abuse must really be on the rise. Because I'd been out of the country. I've been like sailing. Right? Right. And they told me no, that they were getting shots and puffing up those lips, right? And I suppose if you, I guess that's okay, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, okay. But, see, you'd think they would know not to do it on camera, because, you know, they get late lip. You know, because, I mean, <laughs> it's like you're watching, and there's... And now, it's because I'm an actor, and I tend to overanalyze and want to figure things out. There's something wrong with the way that person's talking. And it's because it's infinitesimal, and it's not a... Con it's not, and they don't know it, but their lip's are late, because it's, it's not where it ought to be. <laughs> You know, so you have a lot of 20 year old, 21 year old well, late lips. Your people. lips are not late, but we are so out of time. I'm sorry. I have to thank you. I'm and sorry. you have to come do this again with us sometime. Sure, I'm sorry. Oh, no, thank it's, you. It's so not like much. I get right to the point. <laughs> well, you did now. Thank you. A pleasure. I'm sorry. Elizabeth Ashley. Thank you. <laughs> To order a transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send $6.95 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest. Music